All right, I think it's about uh, time to uh, begin. All right, so uh, as I said in the first lecture, this, this lecture is going to be about energy scales and understanding how looking at different energy scales in physics helps us characterize the system. And in particular, when we ask about critical phenomena, which just sounds like jargon now, but I'll, I'll explain precisely what it is. So something that's often said when you go to kind of public science talks Maybe you've heard this, and it's not entirely clear what the context of it is, is that physics is organized by energy scales. What, what does that really mean? It means that, you know, you, we, we know, we are, we are told by high energy physicists that everything is made up of, you know, quarks and leptons, these very tiny things that are, you know, super microscopic on the order of, you know, sub angstrom scales. But if you're just, you know, worried about your everyday life and you're worried about the standard mechanics of, you know, making sure your car drives, you don't have to worry about those super microscopic details. So the, the real punchline is that depending on the scale at which you are looking at a system, you don't have to know every single detail of what it's built out of. You just need to know some kind of, uh, some, some coarse grain uh, description of it. And this, this can be a hard problem because, of course, if you have a whole bunch of complicated, you know, interacting protons and electrons making up some atoms, and they're building up and making some lattice for a metal or something else, that's a very complicated story with lots of moving parts, and that, that seems like an almost insurmountable problem, right? How do you keep track of the, you know, orders of 10 to the 26 atoms in, in a piece of material to know how that piece of material behaves when you run a current through it? Um, and the answer is, of course, you don't have to keep track of all of those things. So let's let's think about the maybe the kind of the simplest and something that you might be familiar with, a, a notion of kind of emergent <coughs> classical physics, which is the hydrodynamics of fluids. Hydrodynamics just means how do fluids move. Um, so fluids are, of course, made up of you know either little you know, simple molecules and. They're at, say, a finite temperature, so they're vibrating around, and they bounce into each other, and it's some complicated ballistic problem with lots of individual tiny pieces. But, of course, when you turn on the faucet, it just likes, it looks like this nice, smooth, continuous, classical flow, right? So on that long length scale of, you know, you're looking at centimeters and you turn the faucet on, it, there is a nice, simple description of how that piece of water behaves, and you don't have to zoom in too far. Um, but we know, of course, fluids aren't always that nice and clean. In particular, we know that fluids can exhibit what's called turbulence. And so what is turbulence? Well, here's a picture of the, the, the spot on Jupiter. And this is precisely what turbulence is, because this is some huge scale. Right? There's also turbulence in the atmosphere. And what does that mean? Turbulence is when you have eddies, which is these kind of little viscous spirals in the fluid. Uh, when those persist, not just at kind of the atmospheric scale, think of you know clouds moving or the jet stream going around the globe, but if you actually zoom in on that fluid, those eddies don't just persist for those you know gigantic thousands of kilometer scales; but they will persist all the way down to basically millimeter scales. So the idea is that you have these turbulent eddies on the order of the size of your planet, all the way down to if you zoom close in on what exactly the air is doing, you know, uh, and, and, and you have these little swirls on that huge range of scales. And, and, and so the question is, how do you keep track of this? This seems like a, an, an impossible problem to try to, say, put on a computer, because I just told you that you have to care about things down to the millimeter scale, but if you want to model the atmosphere, well, I mean, that's, that's just too many, too many grid points to put on a computer. And so we have to come up with a better way of understanding how to go from these super short distance scales to much longer distance scales. Um, and one of the ways we, we think about this problem is something that maybe you remember from your chemistry class, which is the notion of phases of matter and phase transitions. So this is, of course, the phase diagram for water. This is the temperature axis. This is the pressure axis. You know that if you get water cold enough, well, it it freezes into ice. If I heat it up, it eventually becomes water, and then eventually boils. So here is just one atmosphere, ice, water, gas. And we know these things look very different 
in the sense that if you just look locally at them, the ice is really a rigid solid, right? I mean, if you hit it hard enough, it'll fracture, but it's very different from water, which is a fluid, and more importantly, water is an incompressible fluid, right? You can't squeeze water down into a smaller volume. Whereas if I have water vapor, it's also a fluid in the sense that it, it flows like a fluid, but it's a compressible fluid. And so these are very distinct looking ways that a bunch of H2O molecules can behave. And more importantly, I, I want to point out that there are these lines between them, right? So we know that if you cross this axis, ice will melt. That's called a phase transition. If I boil water, it starts to evaporate. That's also called a phase transition. So let's just have some obvious pictures. Okay, ice melts to water, water boils to gas. I think we're all reasonably familiar with this. Uh, if anyone has ever played with dry ice, they're also familiar with the notion of sublimation. But you can also see this in H2O. Imagine that I reduce the pressure in my laboratory very, very low. Then that means that as I heat a system up, it looks like it has to go from ice to gas. Now, you're never going to see that on the stovetop. But you, you surely have seen pictures of dry ice. Someone takes them out of their liquid nitrogen chamber. You put it on the table, and you see this gas in here. So this is another type of phase transition. And these phase transitions, while well, important to us, are, well, I'm going to argue, are maybe a little boring. And they're going to be boring compared to another type of phase transition that's going to be the real focus of this talk. So a first order phase transition, what does that mean? That means that if I have water, the blood, uh, one atmosphere, at exactly the boiling temperature, and I have a bubble of H2O gas inside my liquid, being precisely at that temperature means that, well, there's a gas in here and it has a pressure so it wants to push out, but of course we know water has a surface tension and the surface tension precisely balances it. So exactly at 100 degrees, this bubble will just sit there perfectly still and I could put another bubble in there and it would also sit there perfectly still. If I raise the temperature just a little bit, we, all, we of course know what happens, water starts to boil. So first of all, this bubble will then start to expand and you know, rise to the top of the pot. And, and, and furthermore, the thermal fluctuations of the, of the molecules, since they're at a finite temperature, means that occasionally you will see little bubbles appear in the water. And those bubbles, when they appear, appear with kind of a, a, a characteristic size. You can think of this as when you put water in a pot and you start to boil it, you look at the bubbles appearing at the bottom of the pan, they all appear at roughly the same size, right? And it's, it's a macroscopic size. You can see it with your eyes, which is important. So this is water boiling. And similarly, water freezing is, roughly speaking, very similar. When I freeze a water, you get nucleation of these little ice crystals. And then, since they're cold, they will freeze the water around them and grow. So the emphasis here is that if I have a first-order phase transition, which is boiling water or freezing water, you have these little nucleations of the, of the new phase, like a little ice chunk in water or a, or a bubble of water vapor in water, that pop up with some characteristic size. And then they start to grow, and eventually the whole system will freeze or evaporate. And what's really important is that if you've ever you know, done, done either of these things in the kitchen, you'll, you'll notice that you can, of course, see the ice crystals as they appear. You can see the bubbles. So they're on a scale much, much larger than the actual molecular scale. Right. So that's a first order phase transition. I think we're all reasonably familiar with it. But there's another type of phase transition that's a little more strange called a second order phase transition. So what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to imagine boiling water, but I'm going to boil water having increased the pressure of my sample a tremendous amount. What happens is if I imagine boiling water across this line, or this line, or this line, approaching this thing called the critical point, the, the size of those gas bubbles in the water as they appear gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And as you approach the critical point, those bubbles uh, appear at kind of arbitrarily small scales, and you have this kind of uh, well, what's called critical opalescence. So let me just briefly mention here, OK, so 
If this little bubble is of the size of, let's say, a millimeter in your pot, then it's not going to do anything interesting to visible light, because visible light is 400 to 700 nanometers in wavelength, so there's not going to be anything interesting. So what happens if I make those bubbles much smaller? And this, of course, is not water, because it's, that's a uh, tremendous pressure to put samples in. So let's go through. So this is, you could think of this as, roughly speaking, trying to boil water right at the critical point. And you'll notice something funny. It starts to look this funny milky, it, it, it look, kind of looks like the way opal reflects. This is called the critical opalescence. What's happening here is that those little bubbles that were appearing are no longer appearing at some visible scale, but are appearing at scales all the way down to you know, orders of hundreds of nanometers, and light is scattering off of them. So you can see here, it's, it's bubbling up at the top, but that's what's happening in here. So what, what's happening is that the, the fluctuations of the fluid as it tries to go from a liquid to a gas phase is occurring at, at basically you know, all scales, all the way down to the tiniest scale. So here you're going to see this is a, a two-fluid mixture, so now this top material is going to go through this critical point and become this uh, opaque, opalescent uh, critical region as it, as it boils through. Um, so we don't need to watch 10 minutes of that video. But what's basically happening here is the following, okay? So this point that's called the critical point occurs at some particular temperature. So again, the idea is that I'm just slowly heating the system through that critical point, through that phase transition. And instead of just having the whole gas evaporate, I have the following. Imagine I have the system where, okay, there's gravity in the system. So I have water at the bottom of my sample, but you know, water can evaporate, and so there's some amount of uh, gaseous water sitting on top of it. Right? As I heat the system up, I start seeing these fluctuations. And the fluctuations occur all the way down to the really, really microscopic scale. So that at the critical point, the fluctuations are everywhere, and I can't, I can't distinguish things. And that as I've heated past it, the whole point of going past the critical point is that you can no longer distinguish between a water and a gaseous phase, which sounds a little puzzling, uh, but it's, it's just the way these things work. You can kind of see that here. So these lines are the lines where there have to be phase transitions. So I'm talking about going through this critical point, but it's clear that I could imagine doing the following. I could crank up the pressure a lot, heat the system up, reduce the pressure, and I've gone from what I called water to what I called gaseous or water vapor, but I never went through a phase transition. So what that means is that those are really morally the same in the sense that they're indistinguishable. And that's what's going on here. You have both the liquid and the gaseous phase coexisting at the same time, being indistinguishable. Now, that sounds a little strange, but that's just the way chemistry works. But what I want to point out is that once I've gone past that critical temperature, when I've heated it past it, I no longer have the sample looking this funny, opaque, uh, milky appearance. It is once again translucent because I no longer have fluctuations all the way down to these super short scales. It's only when I'm sitting right at this critical point that I have the system the, the thermal fluctuations of the system occurring at all scales, making the system cloudy. You can very roughly think of this region here as a region where little microscopic gas bubbles don't have a surface tension, and so they happily coexist with the fluid phase. So yeah, are there any questions about this? <clears throat> yeah. It's not quite clear why uh, it's indistinguishable. You know why you can't distinguish the liquid from from the uh, the gas in the last phase there. You you well I mean the, you you look at the sample and it's just one thing. It's one type of fluid. So I cheated a little bit when I said that water is a really incompressible fluid. That's a bit of a cheat. The statement is that at one atmosphere, water is really very difficult to compress, whereas gas is easy to compress. But of course, as I get closer to this point, it turns out that water is compressible. Uh, and, and, and as I get to the critical point, its compressibility agrees with the compressibility of vapor. So it's really the same phase. So the, the, the real answer is that when I'm really up in this regime, 
what water looks like near this critical point is very different from what water looks like at kind of regular one atmosphere of pressure, right? What I, what I mean by compressible is, right, if I, fill up a, if I fill up a balloon with air, I can squeeze it a little bit, right? If I, fill up a, if I fill up a balloon with water, I can't really squeeze it. The water has to go somewhere. But the point is that when I'm really at the critical point, water and gas look very similar. If you had a beaker of this uh, item uh, e, yeah. would you be able to pour it out like liquid, or would it just expand like gas out of the beaker? It'll it'll expand like gas. It, it's gaseous, right? It, so, it has it has a it is a non-trivial pressure outward. That's that's what I mean when I say water water is compressible. It, it has it has a uh, you know it, you can squeeze it, and that means if you can squeeze it, it pushes back. So it does expand the way a gas does near this critical point. Yeah. In the, it, it seems to me that it's a gas. It's a fluid. Ga ga gas, gas is something that really comes with our standard intuition when we're looking at you know, air or water or other liquids at one atmosphere. You can think of it as a gas in the sense that it's compressible, unlike water. But the, you know, yeah. Does that answer your question? No, it seems that the curve above the critical point no, so so, so the, the point is that let me go back to that previous slide. The interesting thing here is that the, the plot doesn't go far enough, but the point is that once I am at pressures above this pressure, there's just there nothing interesting happens as you tune across this other than how how compressible the fluid is changes as I move across here, but it doesn't change in a sharp way. Whereas if I go across here, I see a sharp distinction. It goes from very, very difficult to squeeze to very easy to squeeze. There's a discontinuity in the compressibility of the fluid. And that discontinuity uh, just turns into a kink here and up here is basically smooth. If I imagine the plot of how compressible the fluid is as a function of temperature. That's, that's, that's maybe a, a more technical but precise way to define a phase transition is when some macroscopic property of the material changes in some drastic way as you cross a transition. So for instance, as I go across here, a plot of the compressibility of the fluid would be discontinuous across that. Yes, so if this wasn't water, if this was something else, like the, the movie I showed you, the scale at which uh, this point appears will be different, and uh, there's actually something special here that for ice, this line bends backward. That's the reason that ice floats. For, for more general fluids, it might go this way, but that's, that's a different thing. But this, this basic shape is common for most fluids, in the sense that at very, very low temperature, they always have to freeze up, and then if I have enough pressure, there'll be a liquid regime versus a gaseous regime, but at high enough pressure, there's no difference. But this, this line of ice persists everywhere. It doesn't matter how much I put pressure on the system. If I cool it enough, it will eventually freeze. Yeah. I, I guess something mentioned by Francis Crick that the fluid that Oh, so, so sublimation is just looking down here, right? So sublimation is, if, if, you, if this was a diagram for dry ice instead, uh, then, you know, we'd be looking at taking a piece of dry ice and, uh, you know, heating it up so it goes from here to here, and so it's clear that the transition is just going from ice to vapor. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, so when you were mentioning that critical point, so what you're saying is that, like, does the water from that, from that perspective So the, the, the critical point is where here, as I cross the line here, yes. there's a jump in the compressibility of the fluid, among other things, but the, that's, that's an easy example. And it, there's always a jump, but how big the jump is gets smaller and smaller benches. And here, the jump is exactly zero, and up here, it just smoothly varies. So, so if there are no other questions about fluids, this is all a, a cheat because it's this critical point that I'm interested in. And to be able to analyze that from the point of view of someone like me, who is not a physical chemist, but you know, is someone who's interested in electronic structure, let's think about magnets. Right. So what is a magnet actually 
Uh, that's, that's something that maybe you've not spent too much time thinking about, but uh, you might remember two lectures ago, I talked about electrons and the fact that electrons have spin, and that spin is basically an arrow that points in some direction. That's, of course, a little more nuanced than that, but you can think of it that way. Now, something I didn't tell you when I talked about electrons, but something that is indeed true, is that this spin of an electron also makes the electron look like a magnet in the sense that there is a north pole and a south pole. So here's a pictorial figure of, I have an electron and its spin is pointing up, and these are magnetic field lines. So here's the north pole, and here's the south pole, the magnetic field lines of an electron. Uh, protons also look like magnets, but they're much, much weaker magnets. And so when I think of you know, simple metallic systems, I can more or less ignore the protons making up the ionic lattice, and I'm just going to ask, what are the electrons doing? And the important punchline here is that if I have a material that has a whole bunch of electrons in it, and all of the spins are pointing in the same direction, then that, that is the object that looks like an honest to god macroscopic magnet, right? The thing that makes a compass work or makes things stick to your fridge. So let's try to cook up a, 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 kind of a, a simple model for what the microscopic description of a magnet is. Yes? Can uh, the microscopic magnet or the spins of the electrons and the protons the same or different? It depends on, it depends on the material. The, the, the usual answer is that since the, since the mag since the kind of magnetic strength of the protons is so much weaker, you can just ignore it because since you want your objects to be kind of neutral, there are going to be as many protons as neutrons, but the, the, sorry, as many protons as electrons, but you're just going to ignore the, the effect of the protons. Uh, you could ask about the details of what they're doing, but for what I'm going to be talking about, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to think about the electrons. So here's here's my crude picture. Of a magnet, I have so this is you know a two this is a two D slice through a magnet that's a real three dimensional object, and I have my spins, and now I'm I'm demonstrating what the spin orientation of the electron is by just drawing it as a magnet, right? And it's clear that you remember that if you have two magnets, north is attracted to south, right? So you can imagine that if I have my spins all lined up in here, this is a config configuration they're happy to be in, right? Because I go down here, well, south is next to north, south, you know, south, north, south, north, et cetera. Now, you might worry about the fact that, well, in this direction, these two north poles might want to repel, but I can imagine that these, these directions are much further apart than these directions, so this north-south attraction wins over this north-north repulsion, and so this is the kind of nice low energy configuration that the system wants to be in. All of the spins want to line up. And if I zoom out, this just looks like an honest to god magnet with a north pole and a south pole. Now, the, the way that I'm going to talk about having a theoretical model to describe magnets is going to be the following. I'm just going to assume that for whatever reason, the electrons aren't allowed to hop around. They're stuck in position but the direction of their spin is allowed to move. You can ask me why that's the model I'm going to cook up. The answer is you ask a material scientist, this is my material, is this a good approximation? They will say yes or no. And if they say yes, you're happy and you do your calculation. If I'm at finite temperature, finite temperature means that the system has thermal fluctuations, right? You, you probably heard that temperature is basically kind of an internal kinetic energy of molecules. Now here, the internal kinetic energy is just letting the orientation of the magnet rotate, but I'm not going to let the electron move around. I'm just going to let it rotate. So if I heat the system up, well, thermal fluctuations are going to want to knock all of the magnets out of order. And so if I have the system too hot, the thermal fluctuations ruin this nice, pretty magnetic order that I had. And on this side, it's clear, there's really no net large-scale magnetic field. So this side, when it's too hot, doesn't look like a magnet. If it's cold, they do look like a magnet. And so schematically, you have, again, a phase transition, right? So this axis is the temperature axis. So I have my material, and I imagine heating it up. So at very low temperatures, a ferromagnet just means, oh, sorry, I should have said this on the previous slide. So the nomenclature 
is that this picture here is called a ferromagnet. I, I, I don't know enough Greek and Latin to know why that's precisely what it means, but ferromagnet just means all the spins and all the magnets oriented in the same direction. This side is called a paramagnet. Paramagnet just means not really a large scale magnet. It's built out of tiny magnets, but there's no large scale magnetic order. Before, yeah. why, why is the meaning of the separation in that magnification of the south north? You have a letter D. Oh, sure. That, that's just, just <coughs> saying that these, these magnets are much closer in the up down direction than the left right direction. And that's, that, that's so bad, right? Because if these two north poles were near each other, they would, of course, want to repel. So I'm assuming that the spacing in this direction is much, much larger than the spacing in this direction. So that D doesn't have any other meaning that just... Uh, D, D, is, D is roughly the atomic spacing in the up-down direction, which I'm assuming is much, much smaller than the atomic spacing in the left-right direction. And so, so here you see, yes, there's still average distances between these things but it's kind of, it's much messier. So here's a picture of something that, and again, I'm gonna apologize for introducing nomenclature. The magnetism of the sample, this is something that's called an order parameter. It's called an order parameter because it tells you how ordered this system is, right? I told you that it's strictly zero temperature. All the magnets line up perfectly, and so it's a perfectly ordered system. If I heat it up too much, the magnets are all just pointing in random different directions. There's no net magnetic field because they basically cancel out. So the, the, this term, the magnetism, is just a question of what, how big the macroscopic magnetic field that the system produces is, which you can measure in various ways. Right? You can imagine running currents through it and looking at some uh, you know, V cross P force. This, this is something that's easy to measure in a lab. And so this is what, uh, not Marie Curie, but Pierre Curie, actually, one of the few things named after the male Curie is the Curie temperature of magnets, which is that if you heat up a ferromagnet to some temperature, as you heat it up, you'll notice that the magnetic field that, it, that it's emitting gets weaker and weaker and weaker and eventually vanishes, and then there's no measurable macroscopic magnetic field. So this is the plot of that rough average magnetic field strength. As you heat the system up, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and vanishes. So I, I want to emphasize this is different than the phase diagrams that I was drawing previously. Temperature is a tunable thing, but magnetism isn't a tunable thing. It's something that you measure. Whereas in the previous diagrams, I had two tunable parameters, a pressure and a temperature. So this is different. I, just want, I, want, to, I want to make sure that's clear. Great. So what happens if we imagine the following? I take my magnet, everything is nicely oriented, and I heat it up. And then I cool it back down. You'd like to think that all the spins will kind of perfectly realign. But that's not actually what happens, right? They realign in clumps. You get kind of bubbles of different pieces of magnets. And this is something that's done experimentally. You can, you can really do this in a lab. And you'll find that the system will break up into different pieces that have different magnetic orientations. So I heat it up so that the spins are disordered. I cool it down. And because you have this north-south, north-south orientation that it likes to get in, well, say in this clump, they start lining up this way. Over here, they started lining up in a different direction. And you know, it's very unlikely that you'll get this on huge scales unless you do it very, very carefully. So you get these different kind of bubbles. These are really different than bubbles in boiling water, right? Because th these are uh, bubbles of the same phase. It's just that the magnetic field is pointing in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, you can also destroy a magnet by hitting it. So when you hit a magnet, is it also creating bubbles, or is it more random disorientation? I mean, I imagine if you hit a magnet, you're just going to fragment it, right? Uh, no, you could destroy a magnetic field by, I mean, a magnet by a Well, I, I, sure. Oh, oh, sorry, I misunderstood what you're saying. Yes. So what, what you'd basically be doing there is you'd be, if you hit a magnet, what you're doing is you're dumping in a bunch of energy to it, and that energy lets the spins rotate around. And then presumably you end up with an effect, roughly speaking, like this, where they have this energy, and so different regions can reorient themselves in different random directions. But it would still be regions of bubbles like that. I, I suspect so. I suspect so. But I mean, it probably depends on the details of how you do it. But morally, you could make an analogy, right? Because heating the system up is also just dumping energy into it, and cooling it down is taking energy. 
Yeah. Is this this orientation time dependent? No. So, so the idea is that I heat it up and I cool it down and I wait a while. I do this very slowly. And then once at the end of the day it's really cooled down nicely, I look at it and these are all stuck. They're not free to move anymore. Just like in the original magnet, the, the orientation of the magnet doesn't change in time. Suppose you did real fast, but it's still have the same orientation. Sorry, say what? Is? Suppose you did real fast. Uh, you cooled it down real fast. If I cooled it down real fast, the, yeah, I, I suspect it would, if you cooled it down real fast, these bubbles would be smaller, but still at the end of the day they would get stuck. For, for, for at least for my simple model of what I'm describing a magnet as. So, since there's interesting things as we cross this line, I want to ask the question, what is the physics of precisely what's going on right at the Curie temperature? So, to be able to kind of show you nicer movies, I'm going to simplify my model even more, and I'm going to say, in my sample, the spins can only be up or down. And this is just the picture that you saw previously, where in the magnetic phase, all of my spins are, say, pointing up. And in the non-magnetic phase, well, some are pointing up, some are pointing down. And on average, the average orientation is zero. Right? And this, this is a simplification, but it also, unsurprisingly, has this nice uh, critical temperature. So let's, so let's watch a video. And so what is this picture? This is a picture of, say, a 2D slice of my sample. The white spots are spin up, the black spots are spin down. I'm starting at a temperature above that critical point, and I'm going to cool it down. Let's do things nicely. And so you see, I have these thermal fluctuations. It's kind of jittering all around. And there's kind of roughly a scale to these fluctuations in the sense that you can see, okay, all of these little blobs are roughly kind of showing up at the same size. <coughs> and as we see, we cool it down, the size is changing. But now we're approaching the critical point. I want to get ready to pause this in the right spot. And you want, I want to point out, I'm really bad at this. Come on. <laughs> So here we are basically right at the critical point. And it's hard to see because this is a blurry picture, but what's happened is the following. There are tiny little blips, and there are slightly bigger blips, and there are large scale blips. And what's actually happening here, this isn't a great video, so it's hard to see it precisely, but what's actually happening is that there's fractal structure. There are these fluctuations of going from white to black on all scales. And you know, if I if I zoomed out, it would look self-similar in the way that fractals do. And then, as we cool the system down further, now we're going below the critical temperature. We're going to see that we're going to construct these islands, right? So now you're starting to lose the small-scale structure, other than these little thermal fluctuations. And now, let's speed this up. As I cool it down even further, you notice that indeed, look, I have again these islands of spin up versus spin down. I am at a finite temperature, so there are these occasional thermal fluctuations, but now, right, this really is that picture I had before of these islands of different magnetization. So this temperature doesn't go that well. So is that, is that picture clear? Above the critical temperature, let me just go over it again. Above the critical temperature, I have these fluctuations all order at these small scales. And so if I take any region of this, the average is basically exact cancellation between up and down. Precisely at the critical temperature, I have this emergent, self-similar fractal behavior, which I didn't have away from it. And then below the critical temperature, I get this freezing in these little islands of spin up versus spin down. Is this a simulation? Or a yeah, this is, this is a Monte Carlo simulation of the ice model. And it might actually be a Monte Carlo simulation of the 2D Isaac model, but instead of the 3D, but yeah. So yeah, so this, this is, of course, you just put it on a computer and, and say what happens in some approximation. Because otherwise, it's hard to get these nice type of videos. All right, thanks. My question. Yeah? When you're in that island state, is it still considered a you know, kind of fractal, self-similar? No. It's really only right at 
the critical temperature that it looks precisely self similar So on the next slide, I'm going to try to explain exactly what I mean by that in, 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 in a little bit. Right, so okay. So exactly the critical temperature, you have this beautiful fractal structure. But there are fluctuations at all scales in the idea that, look, I can see this chunk here, but I can see that it's also made up of smaller chunks and smaller chunks and smaller chunks. Uh, and then below that critical temperature, there's some freezes. But I want to point out that these bubbles are not appearing the way that bubbles appeared in boiling water at one atmosphere. Right? They, it's, it's, there's no first order structure. It's really continuous through it. Right? There, was no, there was no sharp appearance of little bubbles of finite size. So, so, right. so here I'm, I'm making mentions of, kind of this average correlation length. The correlation length is basically, you can think of it as a measure of how far do you have to go before the sign changes. Well, no, that's not quite right. But yeah. The, the, the correlation like this, what's the average size of these blobs? And so what I meant, at a temperature away from the critical temperature, you find that, uh, that, that, that they're on a certain scale. So what's happening here, just experimentally speaking, is that here's a plot of temperature versus the magnetic strength. And as I see, as I heat the system up, it vanishes. And it doesn't vanish in some nice linear way or quadratic way. It vanishes with some very funny exponent, which experimentally kind of looks close to one third. All right, so here, this is just how quickly this vanishes. Above, above TC, where I had all of these little fluctuations, there was a scale to those fluctuations in the sense that if I, if I ask about a fluctuation here versus a fluctuation here, there's a sense in which I can ask how correlated are they, right? And if I have them very close, well, they're fluctuating nearby each other, they can talk to each other, but as they go further and further away, they lose the ability to talk to each other. And at some distance where that drops off, that's what's called the correlation length. And what happens is that as I cool the system to the critical temperature from above, this correlation length that's denoted by the Greek letter C, um, diverges, again, with some funny power. It doesn't diverge as you know, one over this distance. It diverges as one over this distance to the power roughly two-thirds, which is very, you know, th these are approximations, and these are kind of really early 20th century approximations to what these numbers are. But it's kind of useful pictorial. So the idea is that on both sides of this picture, I see that away from the critical temperature, there is some notion of a scale, okay? Below the critical temperature, I can say there is a scale. That scale is the strength of the magnetic field, which gives me some kind of energy scale or length scale. Similarly, above the critical temperature, there is a scale, which is a length scale. But as I approach the critical temperature, that length scale explodes. And so the system is correlated with itself on arbitrarily long length scales. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of precisely how you would derive this, but if I treated the system not in a real quantum mechanical way, being made of quantum mechanical spins, but if I treated it as basically being classical spins interacting, and I'm suppressing the details of precisely what the interactions are because it's not that important, if you treated this as a classical thermodynamics problem, you would find that those two coefficients are exactly <coughs> one half. And this disagrees with experiment. It was known before 1900, people did these experiments. And, and it was seen that, well, this number should really be one, closer to one third. This number should be closer to two thirds. So we're missing something. And what we're missing is really the quantum mechanical fluctuations of the system, of course. That's what you miss if you treat the system classically. <coughs> That's the, the, the term for neglecting those things is something called a mean field approximation. Sometimes that approximation is good, sometimes it isn't. It turns out that when we look at the Curie point of magnets, it's a mistake to, to ignore that. Now, if I make this system really, really, really hot, eventually that phase will look like classical physics. You can neglect quantum mechanical fluctuations. But for the Curie temperature, it's not an extremely high temperature. It's, it's, it's cool enough. You do have to worry about quantum uh, stuff. So we have to ask about quantum mechanics. So a subtlety that is going to get into one of the reasons that Ken Wilson got the Nobel Prize uh, is that 
in very high dimensions, more than we have, like say four plus one dimensions, four spatial dimensions, uh, quantum, me quantum mechanical fluctuations can be ignored safely. The idea is basically that if you have more spatial directions, there are more directions for your fluctuations to move out into, and so they don't run into each other as often. Right? If I have an interactive system, I have to worry about a quantum mechanical fluctuation over here, and another quantum mechanical fluctuation over here, and they bump into each other, and they interact, and something interesting happens. But if there's so many different directions for them to go in, they almost never bump into each other, and it's reasonable to ignore that issue. Um, and, and this was Ken Wilson brilliant idea to try to extrapolate from high dimensions to three dimensions. Um, but before I get into that, I want to talk about something that I, I didn't talk about when I was introducing notions of quantum mechanics. So remember that when I was talking about quantum mechanics, I said that when you think of quantum mechanical objects like electrons, you need to think of them as extended wave-like objects, right? There's this thing called the quantum wave function that really describes the dynamics of the system. And that's a cute math story. But there's something else that you can think of it as, which is that the quantum mechanical description means not just taking the simple classical path of the particle, but summing over all possible paths. Here's kind of a crude picture of it. So the idea is the following. OK, I have, say, some source where I'm emitting electrons, and I have a detector over here where I'm measuring them. Maybe there's a double slit in between. I'm not caring about the details right now. How do I know what the wave function over here is if this is where I'm shooting out electrons? Well, the idea is that I have to consider every single path from my source to where I'm detecting. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to imagine a clock running on each of these curves. right? And, uh, and, and, I, and I want to know, okay, how long does it take to go along this trajectory versus this trajectory versus this trajectory? And if I have a clock adding on each one, well, I see, okay, this clock rolls around and it comes back at, you know, 9 o'clock. This one, it's only 3 o'clock. This one, it's some other time. Remember, that I, I said previously that the wave function is a, is a complex number object. And I can always turn an orientation on the clock into a complex number by just saying that it's a complex number which, whose phase is just the angle on the clock I'm pointing in. And I, and I have to add up all of these paths. Now this seems like this is, I made the problem much, much worse, right? Previously, I had simple differential equations to solve, and now I'm talking about this seemingly impossible hard, impossibly hard problem of adding up every different path that goes between these and assigning them a number and averaging them all. But it turns out that those are, in fact, exactly mathematically equivalent to descriptions. The idea is the following. My wave function over here is I have to sum over every possible path, and I say the length of that path uh, turned into some phase where the, you know, I have to put units in here, and so I have to put a factor of h bar and the mass of the particle times the time of the path. If I add all of these up, I precisely reproduce the wave function that I would have gotten if I had sat down and tried to solve the mathematical problem of Schrodinger's equation. So again, the idea is that I draw every single path from my source to where I'm detecting. I assign a number to that path based on how long it is. I add up all those numbers over here, and that tells me what the wave function is. It's, it's, it's surprising that this very, very complicated story is exactly the same as the one I told you about earlier, but it's true. And you can check that if h bar, remember h bar is Planck's constant, it tells you about the scale at which quantum mechanics are important. If it's small compared to the scales that you're looking at, then it turns out that the dominant contribution is just looking at the paths that are basically straight lines, right? And then all these other things kind of cancel out. So if this distance is really, really long and my particle is very, very heavy, all I care about is keeping track of the particle going in the straight line between my two points. But if I'm working at quantum mechanical scales, I really have to do this averaging of all of the, over all of these other paths. Yeah. I was going to mention, um, so are these waves similar 
this, this is. So these are still kind of classical curves. Right. But if I was describing the classical physics here, I'd say for a particle to get from here to here, the only way it can do that is to just go in a straight line, right? Unless you're acting on it with forces, which in this picture I'm not. So these are not kind of standard classical paths that a particle would go on. But quantum mechanically, since the particle is really a quantum mechanical extended object, it feels all of these different paths it could have gone on. Again, this sounds weird, but it's, 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 it's just the way quantum mechanics work. Dr. Roberts? Yeah. Uh, this is why you use me completely. Is it supposed to what the Hamiltonian is doing? This no. So the the details of how exactly I assign a number to each path and add them together depends on the details of the system, right? Do I apply electric or magnetic fields? Is there a ball and a spring? Is there a particle orbiting an atom? Those those are details. But the punchline is always going to be that if I want to know how a particle gets from here to here, the point is that it takes every path simultaneously because it's really an extended object. Now, this thing called the, the path integral, as, as Feynman coined it, path integral, it just means that I'm looking at every possible path and they're all contributing to some overall path. And you can organize those paths into how wiggly they are, very crudely speaking, right? So if I want to start here and end here, there are lots of different paths, right? I can have a path that's just a straight line. I can have a path that wiggles once. So this has some fixed wavelength. And I can imagine one that wiggles a lot more. This one has a much, much shorter wavelength, right? So this is for a simple example. But for, for generic systems, when I'm summing over all different paths, I can, I, can, I can grade them by what their average wavelength is. Now, if I don't care about a wave, if I don't care about the descriptions on distance this short, I don't need to keep track of the fluctuations that are this fine grained. So what that means is that if I'm interested in physics at some fixed length, that really when I sum over paths, I don't have to keep track of paths whose average wavelength is smaller than the scale at which I'm looking at physics. I can, I can ignore it. Now, the way in which you ignore it is very important. So that was for classical, that was, sorry, that was, that was for kind of electrons moving in space. But I had this story of spins on a lattice. So what is the, quote, path integral, unquote, for them, again, it's a sum over all different paths here. The paths are really just different configurations of spins on the lattice, right? I have up, up, down, up, down, dot, 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 or I have, you know, down, up, etc. And so you have to imagine every possible configuration of the ways in which spins are pointing on your lattice. And here, the notion of kind of shortest path is the one that has the lowest energy with respect to how I say the spin interact, right? So if I want the spins to all be aligned, it's lower energy if they're all going up, 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 than if they're going up, down, up, down, up, down. Right now, finite temperature thermal fluctuations are, are, are coming from looking at other, uh, other configurations that aren't perfectly the ground state. So what we're doing is, again, we're doing this weighted sum over all possible configurations. So the way this works in statistical physics is I don't want to bog us down with too many equations, but the important thing is the following. I can, uh, I can extract the free energy of the system, this F, that depends on temperature and other things. All of the detailed information about how, what's happening in the system is in this object F, and it's just done by a, sum over, a weighted sum over configurations by something that, here's the plot of E to the minus X, and you'll see that if I increase the energy, this number gets very, very, very small, very, very quickly. Okay? But if the temperature is kind of big, then I have to include some of the slightly highly excited states. Uh, and in very low temperatures, only low energy states matter. Now, I just told you this story about how we don't want to have to keep track of, of physics on scales shorter than we're looking at. So how do we do that? I basically say I'm going to split my sum over different configurations into sums over configurations whose wavelengths are shorter than some length scale L, and configurations whose wavelengths are larger than that length L. All right? Now, the problem is that in my complicated interacting systems, the energy is not just a simple function of what the wave vector I'm looking at is. 
because it's clear, right? If I scatter a particle with one wavelength off of another, then the outcoming wavelengths can change. And so if I'm just looking at wavelengths that are uh, longer than this very short wavelength system, the details of what this guy was doing are still going to affect the problem. Now, last week I told you guys about band theory, and band theory was a very special case. I ignored interactions, and so this wasn't a problem. But in general systems, it's extremely important. So how does the coarse grading work? The idea is that basically I can do a partial sum over the very short distance scales. And if I do a partial sum over short distance scales, so I started with the original energy of the configurations, and this partial sum looks like an effective energy over coarse grained configurations. Now, what does that actually look like? The idea is the following, okay? I have my grid of spin ups and spin downs, and I imagine cutting this up into chunks, right? So I've cut it up into three by three blocks. And for every three by three block, I say, well, is the average spin up or down? And here it's up, so I draw it up. Here it's up, I draw it up, 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 down, down. So this is precisely what I mean by coarse grain, right? I kind of, I say, cut this up into regions, ask what the rough average magnetics or spin orientation is there, and then kind of zoom out. And that's how I go from energies at some scale to energies at a more coarse grain scale. So this is what I just said. We're averaging over spins and blocks uh, to construct effective spins. This procedure is called the block spin uh, for normalization that Leo Kadmoff invented in the late 60s. Uh, now, it's clear here that because I'm neglecting the dynamics between how these spins are talking to each other, because I've just approximated them with one spin, my average system doesn't have energetics or dynamics that look precisely like the one I started with, right? So my rescale energy is not going to look like my original energy. But if I imagine that I can kind of do an infinitesimal version of this, right? So if I'm really looking at individual spins, I'm in trouble because I really have to go from you know, you know, nine to one or four to one, and you can't really do that in an infinitesimal way. But if I if I've squinted enough, that the system really looks like it's a continuous medium. Then you can imagine, say, the energies at length scales L plus some small amount is going to look like the original one plus some small correction. So this is the idea, is that as I go from the ultraviolet or short distance scale to the infrared, I'm just doing this coarse grain procedure. I go from having all of these points to fewer and fewer and fewer. And this is what's called the renormalization group flow. What you need to do is you need to say, I need to keep track of the energy of these configurations and how it transforms under these rescalings. And Energies are important because if you know the energetics of the system, that means you know how it evolves in time, you know its dynamics. So the, the, these energies tell us about how it's interacting with itself, what it's doing. So since the energetics tell us about how these spins are interacting with each other, what does that mean? That means that what we thought of as coupling constants in the problem, like for instance, the strength of the repulsion between two electrons or the strength of the magnetic dipole interaction between ma two magnets aren't, co co aren't coupling constants. They're a function of the scale at which you were looking at the problem. Now, if you've come to earlier content lectures, you may have heard about this before. Usually, it's talked about in the standard model of particle physics, where you say the coupling constants of particle physics, right? There's a strong force, an electromagnetic force, and a weak force. And they're not constants, they depend on the energy scale you're looking at. Now remember that energy is basically one over the wavelength of your system. So as I increase in energy, I'm going to shorter and shorter distances. Similarly, as I decrease in energy, I'm going to longer and longer wavelengths. <coughs> so in high energy physics, you see this all the time, right? You take a proton, you zoom into shorter distance sales, you can see it's made out of quarks. You zoom out, you see the protons make up atoms, and so on and so forth. Now, High energy physicists, of course, are interested in high energy, so they want to go this way. They want to go increasing in energy. We're interested in kind of lab scale physics, and so we want to be zooming out. So we are always interested in going down in energy or longer in, in kind of length scales. So, all right. So I'm going to be a little brief here. Um, so I said earlier that if you're in high enough dimensions, 
that quantum fluctuations are basically negligible, and you can ignore them. For the ferromagnet, it turns out that 4 plus 1 dimensions is actually big enough that you can completely ignore the quantum, quantum effects. And so Ken Wilson's insight was, can we go from 4 plus 1 dimensions to 3 plus 1 dimensions? So how do we do that? So I'm, I'm not going to tell you the details of how this calculation is done. I'm just going to tell you the punchline. The punchline is the following. Let's imagine that I'm going to work in D, the number of spatial dimensions, and it's going to be 4 minus 2 epsilon. Okay? At epsilon equals 0, we know it's trivial, and so we know the answer is 1 half. That was our classical prediction. But if I move epsilon to 1 half, I see that I actually get an answer that looks more like 0.6. Now, you remember previously I said this was supposed to look more like uh, two-thirds. It actually turns out that deep, nuanced experiments tell us that this number should actually be something closer to 0.63. So this seemingly ad hoc cheat where I said, I'm just going to work at 4 plus 1 dimensions and try to push it down to 3 plus 1 dimensions did surprisingly well, right? We got from 0.5 to 0.6 when we were aiming for 0.63. That's kind of miraculous. It, I mean, it really is... A, a, you know, a phenomenal feat that this actually works. Yeah? I was going to say the reason, uh, the reason being from like you going from one half to point six is it through uh, a modern series that you use? Yeah, so there's a series expansion. So, so what's happening here is that I'm saying that this small number, well, one half isn't that small of a number. But if I imagine epsilon is really, really small, at epsilon equals zero, I'm really in four plus one dimensions, and I can completely ignore the effects of my quantum mechanical fluctuations. They just do not matter. The answer is exactly one half. And so if epsilon is very, very small, I can try to calculate things perturbatively in an order by order. So you know, if epsilon was like 0.1, then this would be 0.1, this would be 0.01, and it gets much, much smaller. And hopefully, this gives you some conversion answer. And we see that even just working to this order, we get a pretty good answer. So if you, if you do this procedure more carefully, keeping track of more powers of epsilon, what do you end up finding? You end up finding that, remember, so beta was the, how quickly the magnetization vanishes. C is how drastically the correlation length diverges. And if you work this out to, I think this is of order epsilon to the fifth, I get that this number should be 0.37, this should be 0.63. And recent experiments, if you really follow them down the line, say, well, we're not too far off. Remember that our original guess was that both of these should be one half. So this certainly is an improvement. And so the lesson here is that, remember that in, in my previous formula, when d equals 4, that means you're just ignoring the quantum mechanical effects, the quantum mechanical fluctuations. So including those fluctuations is really crucially important. You do have to keep track of the fact that you have a quantum mechanical system for this to work. OK, so, so again, let's quickly review as, as I'm trying to wrap up. So what do we see from phase diagrams? If we have first order boundaries, we have bubble nucleation. If we have second order boundaries, we have this funny opalescence. We have fluctuations on all scales. We get non-trivial dependence on these quantum fluctuations. Um, how do you know what phase you're in? You know what phase you're in by asking whether or not you can do local measurements. Like for the magnet, you say, is there a macroscopic magnetic field? Or if I'm interested in the superconducting phase transition, does it expel magnetic field? So if I have a, if I have a material and I want to know if it's superconducting, I ask, does a magnet hover on top of it, basically? And these are all things you can measure from local measurements. I want, to, I want to say a few more words. So for these special second order phase transitions, where there's no sharp discontinuity, the fact that this correlation length diverges means that we can make excitations of the system at arbitrarily long wavelengths. And that means that we can make arbitrarily light excitations, or in other words, the energy gap of the system is zero. So in particular, if we we're studying something like electrons, we know that the system must be allowed to conduct electricity because an arbitrarily weak electric field can excite these arbitrarily low energy electronic excitations. Um, yeah, so I, I, if I'm really sitting exactly at the critical temperature, this is something that I want to emphasize, there are no scales, right? The, the magnetization is exactly zero, the correlation length is exactly infinite. And so if I imagine doing this coarse graining, I find that the system is, in fact, exactly self-similar. 
This is the reason that when we looked at that buoy of the Isaac model, precisely at TC, it has this exact fractal structure. And so if you do a coarse graining of the system, it just comes back to itself. And so it's a fixed point of this coarse grain procedure. Right, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some phase diagrams a little bit. I'm trying to give you guys a flavor of what's coming. So the whole punchline of that is that that is the story of how we understood different phases of matter up until basically in the 1980s. And then, as I've told you before, we discovered these new interesting things like quantum Hall plateaus. And they're clearly non-trivial phases of matter. Right? Something interesting is happening in them. Unlike my other story about simple magnetization, these don't have a nice simple order parameter telling you what phase they're in. Right? You have to do this non-trivial measurement that's really non-local. Right? Remember, how do you measure Hall conductance? I take my sample, I drive a current in this direction, and I measure the voltage across these gates. And I find from Ohm's law that the resistance takes this funny quantized value, or nu is just related to this whole resistance. And this tells us that there's a new type of phase that's outside of that regime that I spent the entire day talking about. And it's worth emphasizing how it's different. So these things that are called topological phases are different than the standard phase transitions that I discussed today. The phase transitions that I discussed today, right, you had simple first or second order transitions. There's always an easy local way to determine what phase you're in. Just look at the system uh, very simply and see where you are. And sometimes you get sharp first order phase transitions. Sometimes you're lucky and you get these more nuanced second order phase transitions where you know you, you get scale invariance. Uh, topological phases are different, right? I, I know that if I have a quantum Hall plateau, I can wiggle it a little bit and it still stays in that plateau. That's what it means for it to be a plateau, right? I, I look at this picture. And I see that if I'm really sitting right at one, I can, for instance, wiggle the magnetic field a little bit, and it doesn't change this value of the Hall resistance. And the conductance is exactly zero, so it really is an insulator. So the phase diagram for these guys are much stranger looking. What do these phase diagrams look like? You have, let's think of this as kind of crudely a parameter space for the system. So here is my new equals one, quantum Hall plateau, a third, a fifth, two fifths, two, whatever. I mean, this is really, of course, some much more complicated fractal structure, but I'm giving you a crude drawing of it. In the interior, inside of each of these phases, I have an insulating topological phase, right? It does not conduct electricity normally. And to go from one regime to, to another, I have to go through a phase where I can conduct electricity. So I have these bubbles of insulators. And to go from one insulating phase to another, I have to go through a regime where I can conduct. So that's a crude picture, but we saw this previously, right? So here's my picture of my integer Hall conductance, and here is my new equals one plateau, here's my new equals two plateau, and it's very obvious from here. Remember, the green curve is the conductance. If it's zero, that means the system is insulating, it doesn't conduct. And to go from one to two, I have to go through this region where the conductance is finite. Similarly, from two to three, I have to go through this region where the conductance is finite. Now, this is just one picture where I'm imagining one way of going between these phases by tuning the magnetic field. But it's actually far, far more robust than this. There's no way to get from this state to this state without going through a regime where I have to conduct, even though both of these states are insulators. So there's still a transition, right? There's a phase-like transition. But it's qualitatively different. I'm going from two types of insulators to I'm always stuck with a conducting regime in between. That wasn't the case for first order phase transitions, right? A first order phase transition does not look like this at all. Um, and let me just briefly close by saying I, I gave this example last week of saying that if I have some uh, bands, there are winding numbers on those bands that count the number of vortices. And similarly to the uh, quantum Hall plateaus, it turns out that you can't go from one of these guys to another. If I say, OK, here is a band with winding number minus 1. Here is a band with winding number plus 1. And let's say the Fermi energy is just dead in the middle. That means that here, the Fermi energy doesn't touch a band, so I'm insulating. Here, the Fermi energy doesn't touch a band, so I'm insulating. And the question is, can I go from this system 
to this system right here. I have winding number minus one. Here I have winding number plus one. And the topology of the system is the following. The only way from going from minus one plus one to plus one minus one is to take the two bands and have them touch so that their total number is zero. And then I can break them apart and have different numbers. But there's no way to go from here to here without this intermediate regime. And since these guys have to touch, they have to cross the Fermi energy. So you always have to go through a conducting point. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. I don't think it has to be done in a vacuum for this particular transition. 
video showing this type of For this, I'm kind of curious how that works. I mean, I think that the best version of the videos aren't ones where you, I mean, it's, it's hard to see a sample because what you have to do is you have to have the system and then have some way of you know, coming in and probing how strong this magnetic field is. I personally prefer the numerical simulation of the Ising model because there you just explicitly see. I go from having these bubbles of explicit magnetic orientation to complete disorder. There, there probably are some videos of the ferromagnetic to paramagnetic transition. I think I looked a little bit and didn't find anything that was terribly insightful. But I didn't look very hard. Other questions? Yeah. Going back to that the critical point and where things are like self similar, in your research, I mean, is that just kind of a, a G whiz kind of thing? You don't really care about that point? How, how do you use no. that? No. So, yeah, so the, the crucial part of it being self similar, we write the formula of this Yeah, so, so these self similar points are actually very useful because I didn't, I didn't have time to talk about this. Uh, if you have a system that really is self-similar and has no intrinsic scales in it, uh, so, so that means that you, know, you, you, you have this additional symmetry where I can rescale the system and it has to come back to itself. And I didn't talk about it here, but that co drastically constrains the way that the system can behave. And what often happens is that you go from having some ordinary quantum field theory of electrons uh, to having what's called a conformal field theory of whatever is describing the effect of uh, fluctuations here. Now, the, the objects that are fluctuating without scale are non-trivial composite objects made up of my microscopic spins, but there is a lot of mathematical machinery that drastically constrains what this guy can look like here. So, for instance, in one plus one dimension, so if I, so if I imagine I had a, I'm sorry, in, yeah, in one plus one dimension, so I imagine I have kind of a, just a chain of spins that I do this problem, then for reasons based on the nice things about low dimensionality, it actually gets even more constrained, and these numbers, it goes from the classical values in four dimensions to the two dimensional values that are also constrained, but they're, they're different than this. They're, I want to say, one and one eight, but I think. I don't remember off the top of my head, but they have fixed values that you can derive uh, explicitly starting with saying that however I'm describing this point, it has to be scale invariant in two dimensions. And that, for mathematically beautiful reasons, completely constrains it. And it turns out that that also perfectly matches those experiments. It's just this three plus one dimensional region is this awkward region in between, right? In four plus one dimensions, Quantum fluctuations are boring, they don't do anything, I get these answers. In three plus one dimensions, it's a messy problem, and you just have to work things out to some decimal place. And in two plus one dimensions, uh, there's just, in, in, in two spatial dimensions, there's just a mathematically exact answer that perfectly matches with the experiment. So that's, that's precisely a consequence of this self-similarity of, of having those scales. It's, it's yeah. The, I don't want to go into the details, but the point is that that self-similarity in two dimensions is much, much stronger than in higher dimensions. Just in general, is there uh, areas in mathematics that need to be invented, proven, or improved on to, for, for quantum mechanics? For quantum mechanics, no. So uh, for, for quantum, I mean, so, if, if I go back to this question of topological phases, because that's something that I, yeah. I can give a more interesting answer to. This, this idea of what these topological phases look like, proving that you have to have these boundaries for various systems is an open problem, right? For some systems, it is, excuse me, it is proven that you have to have these boundaries. For some systems, it's merely conjecture that to go between these two topologically distinct, and I, I say these are topologically distinct on the idea of those band crossing, right? To say that to exchange one and minus one to minus one and one, they have to touch in some topologically constrained way. That's, that's why these are called topological phases. And so proving whether or not these things exist, uh, there certainly may be uh, deficiencies in, in, in what's 
prove it mathematically to argue this, but that means there's, there's a robust amount of mathematics that goes into proving this for very simple cases. So, so, so far again, it's not waiting for another homogen to come along or something. Not quantum mechanics, no. I mean, the, the classification problems, yes. But quantum, quantum mechanics, as, as currently described, I think is quantum mechanics and quantum field theory are self-consistent things. You might worry about adding things like quantum gravity, but that's a different story. But for quantum field theory as is, I think having it be a well-defined mathematical system, it, that's, mathematicians might disagree, but no physicist does apply. Yeah? I was looking at, if you go back to your prior slide with the simplification and you're saying, oh, oh the spin up or down. Yes. So I was kind of curious, this is curiosity, of um, uh, the uh, observed and the, um, the classical. Sure. The last one. And you said this was known since the 1900s. Uh, what do you think the physicists back then in the 1900s, what did they think? Oh, it's an, uh, we're going to have to be on the technology, it's an error, or is it open problem? What was their thought? So, right so the people that did these calculations knew that they were making a strong approximation, right? They knew that they were neglecting the quantum fluctuations because it wasn't clear how to include them self-consistently, right? Or morally, you knew how to do it, but it was just kind of a mathematically attractable problem if you started in three plus one dimensions, right? Because then there's just no kind of small parameter to try to expand things about. So, so the way a lot of theoretical physics, almost all of it works, is the following. Okay? You have a system, and you don't know how to solve it. Now, there's a much simpler version of it that you do know how to solve. And if I can imagine going from the solvable system to the interesting system by tuning some knob to zero to a small number, that's called perturbation theory. Because you imagine the small corrections based on the smallness of that parameter. So before Ken Wilson had the idea of saying that one half is a small number, uh, it was just not clear what the small parameter you could use was to try to solve this problem. And so he, you know, the, the idea that you, you know, it's not even obvious that it had to work. It's kind of, for this model, maybe a miracle that it did work, that you could interpolate from four plus one to three plus one, and that interpolation has this parameter epsilon small enough to agree to a good approximation. Wow. So was it like a aha moment for that gentleman, or based on research, or a new the apple fell on his head? Or? I mean, it, I, don't, I don't know yeah. enough about the history. I, I believe, it's been a while since I've read it, I believe if you look at Ken Wilson's Nobel lectures, the first half of it is kind of an overview of a lot of what I talked about in the beginning of this. With, with this definition. But the second half has a historical account. And I believe he does discuss you know, earlier people's work on trying to understand what's happening here and how he came to the insight of trying to extrapolate from four plus one to three plus one dimensions. But I don't remember off the top of my head precisely what he said. Is, it, is, is his speech uh, archived anywhere? So, so this isn't his speech. It's, it's, his, it's his Nobel lecture, which is probably a write-up of part of his speech. But I believe you must be able to find it if you just Google uh, Kenneth Wilson Nobel lecture. Uh, okay. And it's, yeah, it's the second half of it has a, has a beautiful historical overview. And so let me ask, in your field right now, do you have uh, various types of open questions that, whoa, I would like to know how to of course, of course, right? And and you know, a lot a lot of what you do when you're working on hard problems is you say, where where's the small control parameter, right? You know, how do I I, I want to study this system? It's very complicated. What other system does it look like? And can I interpolate between them in a way that I have a controlled approximation, right? You know, I, I, I a controlled approximation means. You know, I work something out you know, to x and x squared and x cubed, and I know that if x is small enough that I have an answer to a good degree if I truncate that. Because if x is 0.1 and I stop at you know, x to the fifth, then I can trust you know, four decimal places. So and that's, that's kind of the philosophy of a lot of what you do. You have, you have to kind of come, come up with the right approximations and understanding in what they are approximating.
technical question, since you have this vast experience. Can you say what's the, what is the biggest problem to be solved in climate change? I mean, that's a, that's a that's too open a question to answer. I think I think the biggest the biggest question and one that I don't expect to see a satisfactory answer to in terms of satisfactory with respect to resolved with experiment is how quantum mechanics and gravity work together. There are lots of conjectures like string theory, um, but that's that's an open question. But it's a difficult open question because it's not one that you have immediate experimental access to. Lots of people spend a lot of time thinking very hard about ways in which they might see hints of it via cosmological data, things like that. Um, but that, that's an example of, a, of an open question that, you know, it's, that, that's kind of a fundamental question. You could also just ask what are hard problems in, in, in quantum systems, and then there are, you know, an infinite number of those. You just take any, any material that people have measured properties of, and they don't have a satisfactory model. There, there are lots of examples of that. There are plenty of, if, 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 you know, Cupre and high TC superconductors, people don't really understand the precise mechanisms that lead to superconductivity. Yeah. The five half state of one Paul is not understood why that's a plateau, etc. But yeah, I mean, there, there, there are, there, there are, you know, lots and lots of open questions. I think that it, it, it's important to distinguish between kind of questions that are purely theoretical in nature and questions that are phenomenological in the sense that phenomenological questions are there's this, there's this effect that we've observed and we don't know how to explain it. That's very different from if I take this piece of mathematical machinery and try to make it work with this piece of mathematical machinery, they don't work together. That, that's, that's the example that I, I say when I talk about quantum gravity. I think that's really the only outstanding issue. If you don't worry about that as an issue, Quantum mechanics and quantum field theory are perfectly well-behaved, self-contained systems. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.